if you have access to electricity, you're doing in-ground production. Um, I would opt, I would recommend polyfilm and then two layers of plastic. That will allow you pretty much to grow all year round. You'll still have to do row covers inside the tunnel, depending upon your climate zone. Um, but you know you can do it. Um, if you uh, want to get into heating the tunnel. Um, yeah, that's when you want to start looking at polycarbonate um, on your gable ends, definitely. Um, and if you have a small tunnel, let's say no more than 48 feet long, um, yeah, you could talk about putting polycarbonate um, over the whole structure. It's just going to be pricey. Polycarbonate has a warranty of 15 years. Um, but I will tell you that um, I we've we've seen tunnels or taken apart tunnels over the years that people had polycarbonate on it and it was on it for almost 25 years. Um, is it in the best condition by year 25? Uh, no, but um, the farmer is still doing their thing, um, you know, and, and, and so I just, you know, I say that and about, you know, extending the life of your polyfilm is because most landfills, um, recycling yards, they don't take greenhouse plastic or polycarbonate, uh, which means this has to go to a landfill. And when that hits the landfill, it's going to be in that landfill for, um, we're talking, you know, I don't know, 5,000 years. Um, an extremely uh, ridiculous amount of time. And so, um, you know, we strongly suggest uh, to folks that any plastic that comes off your tunnel during the construction or the reskinning, that you find a second use for it somewhere, somehow, um, because we got to figure out how to keep this stuff out of the, the waste stream um, as much as possible. Um, and so, uh, you know, moving, moving on, uh, the two biggest pitfalls that we find is that people went too small. You know, they're like, oh man, I wish I would have had 40 more feet. Um, or they don't think about the water. And I really can't stress this um, enough. Um, tunnels, um, they sheet uh, an extreme amount of water. So a 30 by 72 at, for a single inch of rainfall is going to create or shed 700 gallons of water per inch. Um, and if you are on a downhill side of a hill and it rains, you're going to have a flooded tunnel. I can promise you that. Um, so you really need to think about uh, how you're going to mitigate the water that comes off these tunnels. I don't, we've done rainwater catchment off the tunnels. That's a good solution. Um, but if you don't have access to electricity, then you have to think through how you're going to pump that water. Um, if you want to try to reuse it, otherwise you just move it away. Um, and then, uh, for people in, uh, you know, maybe on the Eastern shore and so forth, um, definitely don't build a high tunnel unless you have access to water. <laughs> um, on our farm on the Eastern shore, uh, we built a tunnel, uh, before we had access to water. And, uh, this was years ago and, um, we just, you know, didn't grow anything <laughs> for a number of seasons it's just impossible to keep up with watering um, in sandy soil underneath plastic in the middle of the summertime. Um, so, the, you know, water in both ways on both sides of the tunnel is something to think about. Um, I'll just let me go. Here we go. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So continuing on with this, um, I, we kind of went into this before, um, you know, here's like sort of two axioms, if you will. If you're not going to heat your tunnel, um, then you probably just need to stick with your roll-up sides, single layer of plastic, and vents on the wall. If you are going to try to do long-term season extension and you have access to electricity, go with two layers of plastic. Um, if you are heating your tunnel, um, then it is categorically called a greenhouse. Um, that's the difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse um, heat, essentially. Um, once you introduce heat to your tunnel, then you have to think about air circulation um, to move that heat. Um, and then you have to think about ways you can retain the heat. Um, you know, plastic has uh, maybe an R value of like one. Um, uh, two layers of plastic will give you some cushion. Um, but this is really where polycarbonate comes in and excels, um, having that on your gable ends uh, and then two layers of plastic over the length of the tunnel if you're going to do in-ground in production and heated. Um, that would be my, my recommendation. If you're 
if you really, you really need heat under two circumstances. Let me clarify that. You need heat if you're starting plants in February um, through, you know, May, you need to have heat. Um, you need to have heat if you're going to grow uh, in the ground uh, and you want to be able to seed in the ground um, through the winter. You'll need some form of heat. Um, basically, that the, here's your tunnel. And if it's below freezing outside your tunnel, that freezing temperature, it's going to go underneath that tunnel and make your soil very cold. And so you won't be able to get much germination um, in the tunnel. And so we've seen farmers introduce a minimal amount of heat in those circumstances just so they can get things to germinate in the dead of winter. So you're talking about, you know, carrots, kale, brassicas, you know, radishes, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, another lumber cons um, material consideration is lumber versus steel. Um, steel right now, because of um, number 42 and all these trade things, um, uh, steel is, uh, is a tad bit higher than it has been. Um, and so we've, you know, we don't do much tunnels anymore, but uh, we very seldom have seen steel um, since he took office because of the, the cost. Um, but I will say that uh, if you can stomach it and afford it, steel definitely is the way to go. Um, it will last literally forever. Um, and uh, yes, the embodied carbon it takes to produce the steel um, is something to consider. Um, but the lack of having to trash your lumber after, you know, 10 years or seven years or whatever it is, um, you know, you'll see sort of a net gain between that, um, you know, but for most farmers, you know, 90% of the farmers, they are, uh, we're using, we're installing lumber, lumber baseboards, um, and walls. Uh, usually it's, uh, pressure treated. Um, you know, again, uh, if you want to use, um, some local wood, you know, oak is a good wood to use. Um, you could use pine untreated. Um, you can treat it yourself with um, solvents um, or a wood charring technique. Um, you know, if you want to stick, if you want something that's non-toxic, but that can last um, for any amount of time. Uh, and yeah, the next slide we'll talk about tools. Um, we had a question or um, two questions actually, one about heat sources and one about lighting. Um, <laughs> so the, the first one, since you're talking about heating already, um, was it, is it realistic to heat a high tunnel with in-ground heating? And I, 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 Michael, could you clarify, are you referring to, uh, what kind of in-ground heating are you thinking of? Are you talking about geothermal or um, a different type of? Well, geothermal might be good, but I was thinking of basically hot water. Does I don't care how it gets there. Okay. Yeah. The, the real question is, is it realistic to heat the whole volume of a high tunnel yeah, the roots are important and keeping them heated is important, but then does that heat radiate inside the high tunnel enough? Um, uh, for a larger tunnel, uh, no. Um, so high tunnels, they behave um, the exact opposite. Well, not the exact opposite, but somewhat opposite of a house does in the wintertime. You know, so the houses that we live in, um, we want to condition them to stay warm. Um, so as a result, um, the heat is generated from within and then it radiates out, you know, through heat loss throughout through our roofs, through our walls, through cracks of our windows. Um, and so it's a radiant heat loss. Um, a tunnel, you are generate the heat is being generated by the sun and it's being captured in the wintertime. I'm talking about the fall, winter and spring. It's actually being captured by the earth. And so the, actually the soil is heating up and then you have your air that also heats up, you know, within the plastic. Um, and we call that a heat, a heat sink effect. And that happens during the day. But if it's very, very cold outside and you still get the ambient temperature, you know, is above freezing um, inside the tunnel, that soil is going to reflect the temperature outside. Um, and so uh, if you use hot water, um, uh, if you figure out how to get hot water into your tunnel, um, which is the first big piece, but if you can get hot water into your tunnel, um, yeah, your plants will certainly be, will be happy for it. 
um, but it's not going to increase the overall, you're not going to see heat gain in the tunnel per se. Um, and if anything, um, if you're going to do that, you'll, you'll most likely want to uh, drop insulation. Um, this might sound ridiculous, but it's a very common practice. Um, uh, you might want to drop insulation around the tunnel on your baseboards um, or potentially into the ground around the exterior of the tunnel um, to prevent that cold temperature from migrating in um, if you're going to use hot water. Um, you know, so we there are a few tunnels that I've seen that used hot water um, through a um, uh, solar hot water pump system. Um, it's very involved. Um, it, it works, but it's, a, you know, it's an expensive um, investment. Um, and in their case, they were doing a uh, plant propagation. They weren't um, doing in-ground production. Um, and then uh, what were the, the other question? Uh, the other question was about lighting and um, specifically in a northern climate where there's minimal hours of daylight during the winter. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to have productive plants, um, would, you, would you need artificial lighting and let me and and how much and when like would that be a would that be a what would you be your decision making process there um yeah i mean um you know i've never uh lived further north in maryland so you know my my knowledge set is is pretty local to here but um i will i will say that um when you site your tunnel which is on another slide coming up um you want to site it for maximum solar exposure for your winter months um, because in the summertime you're going to get solar exposure no matter what you do because uh, you're further north so the sun is going to be directly above you um, for very long periods of time um, so you want to site your tunnel thinking about the winter months when that sun is lower on the horizon so you can capture as much of that solar gain as possible um, I will know for plant germination, um, I will say for plant germination, yeah, you'll, you will have to use some sort of um, uh, supplemental lighting of some sort um, to get them to pop. Um, but once they pop um, and maybe past the cod leading stage, you could probably let them just get the natural diffuse light that, um, you know, is inside the structure overall um, would be would be my recommendation. Thank you. And we have one last question, um, and that is, uh, what if you um, combine polycarbonate and wood? Um, do combining those two materials for end walls, does that have an effect on the longevity of either? Uh, yeah, 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 it definitely does. Um, you know, people, uh, I will say that, uh, for example, like Jack and Becky Gurley, I think they replaced the wood on their tunnels. Um, maybe like four or five years ago. And I think that was the first time they've done it in like 15 years. Um, it was a considerable amount of time. Um, you know, um, your end wall framing is not structural. It's just basically there to hold the plastic. And so with polycarbonate being a rigid material, yeah, it's gonna increase the life of your plastic behind it. I mean, your, your wood behind it. Um, and, you know, generally polycarbonate, um, you know, it lasts in any kind of environment. Um, just make sure that there's two sides to poly. There's a UV rated side um, and then there's not. Uh, make sure you have the UV rated side facing out because um, that definitely makes uh, makes a difference. Um, makes sense. And uh, one, one more question um, just on the big decisions part. And then uh, we, uh, we have a couple questions about orientation coming up. So we'll cover that in the next, a couple slides further mm -hmm. on. But, um, uh, do you, would you recommend using row cover in the high tunnel to maintain like a warmer microclimate? Do you find that that's effective? Yeah, that's, that's super effective. Um, it's like awesomely effective. Uh, uh, you know, depending upon the scale of your farm, you know, take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt, um, cause I'm trying to, uh, sort of truncate a, a diverse sector into like a very like you know linear set of like uh, experiences and examples so you know everybody's case is going to be a little bit different um but i will tell you uh if it were me um and i didn't have access to electricity um and i had a tunnel with maybe one or two layers of plastic um 
I, what I would do is I would do rail covers on the inside. Um, and then I would stack, uh, straw bales around the exterior of the tunnel. Um, and that will give you a lot of really good, um, affect. I, I wouldn't put the straw bales, um, on the inside, um, because you could run into a situation where rodents will find harbor, um, on the inside of the, if the straw bales are on the inside of the tunnel. Um, but uh, straw bales on the outside um, are nice. Um, and if you were to cut the bands off of them uh, when you install them, uh, by the time spring rolls around, they, have, they will have pretty well decomposed and you could just plant a cover crop into them um, or you could put a landscape fabric over the top of them. Or if there's landscape fabric underneath of it and you put straw bale on top of it, you can just, straw, you can just pull the straw um, off of your landscape fabric um, once all the grass starts growing in the springtime. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, moving on, uh, uh, if you do it yourself, I recommend a minimum of three people to build a tunnel, no matter how small it is. Um, it just makes conversation lively. Um, and three is better than two and two is better than one. Um, I built plenty of tunnels with two people or just by myself, and it's not the greatest experience. Even three is not a great experience if it's a large tunnel, but um, it makes for a good time. Um, yeah, so here's the tools. Um, it's pretty basic. Um, I will say that this list here, every farmer should own all of this um, just for your own problem solving and DIY and like farm-based construction. Um, this list here will get you very close to being able to build just about anything um, you might find on your farm. Um, and in respect of to a high tunnel, uh, the big tool is a impact driver. Um, you want an impact driver with a big battery on it um, because you gotta drive these, you know, hundreds of screws of self-tapping tech screws through metal. Um, and an impact driver is really best suited to do that. A drill will do it, it's just longer takes a little bit longer um but yeah i'm not going to list off the whole thing here um you know it'll be in the recording and um you know that's about that um it's a pretty small list to build a tunnel okay so i forgot to do one calculation here but um yeah so we're going to get into the example of how to construct a tunnel and some of the decision making that uh, we went through with this farm in particular butterbee farm um, friend of ours laura beth um, really an awesome flower farmer just outside of baltimore in pikesville i think it is um, and uh, yeah so her tunnel we was a 30 by 72 five foot side walls gothic roll up size um, she didn't have any vents on her gable ends, her end walls, um, which is fine. Her climate uh, doesn't get that all that hot. Um, and she's also dealing with flowers. So I think um, her relationship to ventilation is just a tad bit different than uh, we might expect from a vegetable farmer. Um, so you can see the cost breakdown here. Um, again, for people out of state, these are Maryland prices. If you're further south, you're gonna look at these prices like, uh, what? Um, know that things in the south, I'm from Georgia, um, are going to always be a tad bit cheaper. Um, but uh, yeah, as you can see, there's not a whole bunch that goes into it. You have your tunnel package, um, you have the lumber, the price of lumber is um, exorbitant right now. Um, and uh, then you have the equipment went rental, which is a post driver. Um, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, then you have our labor, um, and then that's the grand total. Um, so if you take uh, 12309 divided by, uh, um, I just had that number. I, I think, think it's $5.70 if I did thank it you. correctly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's $5.70 uh, a square foot um, to build this tunnel. Um, and that's about average. Um, for most general high tunnels. Um, for greenhouses, you might start to see that number creep up to $7 a square foot, you know, once you add a heater, polycarbonate, all the fixings and things like that. Um, and uh, the reason I wanted to bring up the square footage cost is because um, that's a really good way um, to understand how much a building is gonna cost. Um, 
you know, if you want to build a pole barn, for example, pole barns on average float right around $17 a square foot. So if you wanted a 2000 square foot pole barn, you can take 2000 times 17. That's going to tell you how much money um, in a rough estimate by rough, I mean, plus or minus margin of 25%, you know, you'd be looking at a price. Um, and that's helpful when you talk to contractors or when you do any kind of budgeting for yourselves, um, you know, versus a home, your average conventional home would be like anywhere from 50 upwards of $80 a square foot. Um, you know, and that, you know, you take that number, if you want a thousand square foot home times 80, all of a sudden, you know, oh, you might be looking at $80,000 to construct it. Um, so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, so getting back to this example, um, four person crew, it took us three and a half days. Um, we probably could have got it done in three days, um, but the weather got us on one of the days. Um, so we had to take a short day. Um, yeah, and so these are all the steps to building a tunnel, regardless of the manufacturer you go with. If you are going with a metal hoop house, greenhouse package, these are gonna be all your steps, regardless of the manufacturer. If you're going to wood frame the tunnel um, or your structure, your greenhouse, it's gonna be a tad bit different, but more or less will follow um, a similar set of uh, procedures. Um, and so the, the thing I wanted to highlight here is um, site the tunnel. Um, it's a really big deal. Um, these are the main considerations that I always offer to farmers. I will tell you that um, nine times out of 10, uh, the farmer is dealing with ease of access. <laughs> Everything else is like part and parcel. Um, and uh, I don't have any problems with that. I, I think that makes sense. You know, you want your tunnel to be situated in a way that's convenient and efficient for your crew or your operation to access it and work it. And sometimes that might not be in the best solar location. Um, but you know, you have, you know, you as the operator, the user has to make that make that determination, you know, we of course, you know, always give our perspective, um, you know, but we're just, um, you know, at the service of, of the farmer. Um, and, uh, and here on, you know, in Maryland, I, I really do stress that like, if you have in Maryland in the springtime, we have a lot of um, very strong northeastern winds that come down. Um, and they will just ruin tunnels. I mean, just totally ruin tunnels. Um, and uh, usually that's because the tunnel was sided with the length of the tunnel taking the brunt of that wind force. And uh, you really want your gable end to take that. It's designed to take that. Um, there's less open space uh, versus if you have the side of your tunnel taking it, it's just bashing on the plastic. Um, it might sneak up under your roll up sides. Um, and then once your wind, once high winds get into a tunnel, um, yeah, it's just gonna, it can potentially cause damage. And so, you know, during high wind storms, we always recommend put your tunnels, your sidewalls all the way down, close the tunnel up as best you can. If wind gets in there and it's really starting to move the tunnel, you just have to cut your plastic in places. Um, and take the L on the plastic um, and either repair it with repair tape um, or a greenhouse plastic repair tape um, or get new plastic um, because it's far cheaper to replace plastic in terms of financial costs than it is to replace um, or to deal with um, damaged steel, um, just from our experience. Um, but again, if you do take out your plastic, find another way to reuse it. <laughs> That's my uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, note. Um, so anyways, um, you know, moving on here. Um, and so squaring the site, um, a tunnel is a really good, good way to have fun with fundamentals. Um, if you're a farm or farmer or an individual that likes to do the work yourself, um, you know, a tunnel is a really good way to, to do that work. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, the, the most important part of building the tunnel apart from siding it properly is squaring the site. Um, so we're dealing with a rectangle. Uh, in this case, a 30 by 72. And so, you know, it's a simple equation, the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it's an equation that's used um, everywhere in construction um, and is highly applicable 
where there are right angles um, in a building. If you have acute, which are less than 90, or obtuse, which are greater than 90, there are amendments to this equation um, to get you know, the answer that you need. But in this case, um, our A is our width, um, which is 30 feet. And then our B um, is 72 feet. So you take 30 squared or 30 times 30 plus 72 squared or 72 times 72. And that gives you a really large number. Um, and you take the square root of that. And in this case, that's 78 feet. Um, and that tells us our diagonal. Um, and you, you have to do that um, in order for your tunnel, which is a, you know, a rectangle, it to be square. If you don't do that, you could install your tunnel and it could literally like be a parallelogram of sorts, you know, um, it can be all out of whack. And so you need that diagonal measurement um, to triangulate um, that third point in a triangle. Because remember, a rectangle is the accumulation of two triangles. Um, and so that diagonal will fix all four corners for you. Um, and I have a video, I believe, um, that shows that somewhere that we'll get to in, 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 another, in another point. Um, yeah, is that clear? Does anyone have any questions on that? Nothing in the chat box. I think you're okay. a good geometry teacher here. Okay, sweet, great. Um, yeah, I love math, um, but you know, we all have, everyone has different relationships with math. Um, yeah, and so uh, when we're driving posts, uh, most tunnels um, in our region are going to be four foot on center. Um, once you start to get into two inch or larger posts, maybe two and a half inch, you'll start to see six foot on center, five foot on center. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see four foot on center in our area for manufacturers. Um, it's got to be plumb in both directions. Um, so plumb, for those that don't know, uh, plumb is perpendicular to the earth or vertical, perfectly vertical from the center of the earth into infinity. Um, that's what plumb is. Level is parallel to the earth. Um, so that's, you know, flat. Straight up and down is plumb, flat is level. Um, so you'll hear me use plumb uh, often um, throughout the conversation today or the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, you want this, you, we use string line, you'll see here in a moment, um, to guide most of everything that we do on a high tunnel, it's pretty simple. Um, and a high tunnel, you don't need it to be level across its length. Um, it can follow the grade of the land. So when we build a house, we want the house to be level because we have to live on level ground. Um, but when you build a tunnel, oftentimes Maryland land is sloped, your tunnel can reflect that slope. Um, or, or the grade of that land. Across the width of the tunnel, the 30 feet or the 24 feet, you want those corner, po corner posts to be level to themselves. Um, and you can use a string level or a laser or a water level um, to get that done. Um, yeah, so this is just examples um, here. I must say like I'm very bad at taking pictures because I'm always working. <laughs> and so it's usually an afterthought. So, I, so please excuse me for not having some of the, uh, the better pictures um, for some of this. Um, yeah, so you can see here, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, uh, our string line here, and I think in the next video, you'll see how we actually use it. Um, here's some examples of the string line there. Um, and just take note of this bolt here. Again, this is specific to a Nolts package, but other packages have similar aspects to them. Um, with nolts, we actually put our bolts in before we raise our hoops so that when the hoop comes down, it drops uh, into the pipe and, on, and stops at that bolt. Um, and then we just take the bolt out, drop the hoop the rest of the way, and then slot it through both holes. Um, this prevents um, the, uh, the hoop from just dropping all the way down into the pipe, which is really annoying to pull back out. Um, and then we also use a pneumatic post driver. Um, we have probably sledged um, a mile of pipe in our lifetime. <laughs> and then one day, one year, we learned that this thing existed. 
um, and for three hundred fifty dollars, we can drive um, one hundred fifty feet of posts in three to four hours. Um, versus if we're driving it by hand, uh, you know that would take uh, a whole day, and you'll be very tired, and it's the only thing you'll do. Um, and so, just you know, it's a very loud machine. Um, but you can see here, uh, Chelsea is justifying the pipe to the string and keeping it plumb while Ferris is just um, operating um, the driver. That post driver weighs about um, 70 pounds. Um, so it's definitely a workout, um, as you can tell by the sweat on his back uh, by the time you're done with it. Um, and that's basically it, uh, you know, for that, that particular machine. Um, and uh, here's another video that kind of uh, says what I was saying a moment ago. And so here is a start of our site. The site's already been squared out. It is a 30 by 72 foot tunnel. And so, how we start is we identify our two reference points, which usually is the front of the building. So it's this corner and that corner. Then we run 70 feet, 72 feet down there. We find our diagonal, which is the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In this case, that gave us 78 feet on the nose. That fixes our two corners down there and therefore then we have a rectangle that's based upon 90 degrees at the corners. Then we establish our grade. In this case, uh, we had a sight laser. You can use a string level without a problem. Um, but what's critical here for any high tunnel is that your gable ends, the, fronts, the front and the back of your tunnel are level to each other. Down the length can follow the grade uh, I often say that building a high tunnel is like building a house minus all the BS. Uh, and so in this case, the front of your tunnel and the back of your tunnel must be level to itself from corner to corner, but the grade of the tunnel can follow that of the land. Once we establish our corners, we then run string line. String's been used for a very long time. And in our case, we pull 24 inches down make a mark we call it a crow's foot let me go ahead and fix that and our string lines up right there and then on every post we pull 24 inches down make a mark and hammer this thing drive it into the ground until that mark hits that string line because the objective is for our post tops all to plane in and then for our sidewall to all plane in in our case, we used a pneumatic post driver for years. We only used a sledgehammer. And then we discovered this thing for a few hundred extra bucks. It makes our job far easier. We can get this done in terms of posts in the ground and squaring in a matter of maybe four to five hours at most versus you sledge this thing in by hand. It will take you all day at best. And that's all you're gonna be doing. We're able to drive the posts assemble hoops, assemble snow load braces, and raise all the hoops in a single day because of this machine and potentially put up some purlins. Uh, so I strongly advocate for those who are going to build their own tunnel to rent a tow behind air compressor and a pneumatic post driver. They make gas or diesel versions of these. Um, those have issues, but if you can find them, I'd use them. These work great, they don't have issues, and they always work. I think it's about 250 bucks for an eight hour period. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so as you can tell, I really like that post driver. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, as, as someone is, in this case, um, as Ferris and Chelsea were installing the ground posts and squaring the site, um, I was assembling um, the various parts of the tunnel. 
um, which at the onset, again, for this notes package is you assemble the hoops and the snow load braces. Um, the hoops, you wanna make sure you're assembling them on, on level ground um, or as level as you can be or flat ground um, so that when you raise them, they want to stay straight up and down. They don't have like a weird sort of, you know, off curve to them, uh, which happens. Um, and uh, these brace bands, which are these little annoying things here, um, all manufacturers have them. And, you know, you have to, um, you have to pry them apart um, in order to get them over the hoop. Uh, so that's, you know, something to be done. And this just goes to show you the setup. Um, you know, we 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 try to do everything like an assembly line, um, so to keep things as efficient as possible. Uh, and so, you know, we do all the hoops at one time, then we make a big stack. We do the snow load braces at one time, and then we make a big stack. And then, you know, they're done. It takes a few hours, but then it's done. Um, for the snow load braces, uh, again, for this notes tunnel, um, to figure out the placement of of your brace bands and your struts, which are those upright smaller members are called struts. Though uh, the math is you take the overall length of your snow load brace, which was some number that I can't remember, um, and you divide it by three. Um, and that gives you 93 inches. And so why do you divide it by three? Well, if you see by this picture over here, there's three spaces that you're creating. And in construction, um, you are often dividing by the number of spaces, not by the number of pieces um, to figure out placement of things. And so if we took the overall length of this brace, um, let me see if I can just work this backwards, 93 times, 93 times three. So it's 279 inches. So if you take 279 and you just divided it by two, that's gonna give you 139. That's just gonna give you the middle of your, of your brace there. Um, but we have two struts that we have to install and they have to be equidistant. Um, and so the two struts create three spaces. And so therefore you take that 279 number and divide it by three and it gives you um, 93. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically it there for the for those snow loads, um, and you know those get assembled at a later get installed at a later point. Um, but we just try to get all the assembly done at one time, um, so that it makes it more efficient. Um, raising hoops and installing the purlins. Um, again, we treat everything like an assembly line. Um, that's just something I picked up in farming. Um, and it, I just know it works. And so we do all the hoops, we do all the posts at one time. Before we raise a single hoop, we lay all the hoops out on the ground, as you see. So all we're doing when it comes to raising is just raising. So it's just two motions. You bend over, pick the hoop, raise the hoop, put it in. And you repeat that, you know, for 70, 72 feet. Um, and so it becomes more monotonous. Um, but by the time, you know, you can build a rhythm and it just moves quicker that way. Um, and, uh, so before you can run your first run of Perlin, um, and let me just explain what a Perlin is, um, uh, Perlins run perpendicular, uh, to your hoops or your rafters. In other words, they run parallel to the ground. Um, they tie your rafters together and create a full diaphragm, um, across the roof of your structure. So when that tunnel moves the whole thing moves not one individual part um, and so that way the force vectors into the ground uh, more efficiently so but before you can install your first purlin you have to plumb your gable ends and so we have a nice plumb bob but we used a staple gun in this case just to highlight that you can use anything with weight um, and essentially you tie a string on it, you run that string over the outside edge of your gable hoop um, or your end wall hoop. And then you run another string from your corner post, corner post to corner post. Um, and basically uh, you have to pull that hoop back until the two strings intersect and touch each other and they'll make a little cross. Um, I had a video 
um, <laughs> on it. Uh, and I didn't realize um, it only recorded for a second until uh, we started making this presentation. So sorry about that. These are the best photos, photos I got. Um, but it's pretty simple. It's super straightforward. Um, once you plumb that in, um, we will use a, um, a strap to keep it plumb. So we take that strap and we tie it all the way down to a ground post um, just to affix that plump, that um, hoop in a plumb position because um, it will move on you as you start to install your purlins. Um, let me go back here. Um, the purlins, um, in the case of a 30 foot tunnel, there's five runs. So a run is one length down the whole length of the tunnel. So there's one center or ridge purlin, and then there's two on either side of the ridge. Um, the measurement is um, five foot two inches on center is the location of each uh, purlin. And the, and the manufacturer manual has that in there. Yeah, read the manual. It helps um, for some of the pointers. Um, yeah, so then once you have the purlins in, um, you install your baseboards and your hip tracking. Um, your hip tracking or hip board, um, uh, baseboard or skirt board, you know, everyone has some different, there's different nomenclature out there. Um, the key thing here is that um, you have to have a uniform height between the bottom of your hip tracking and the top of your baseboard. No matter how much your land slopes, if it's 54 inches, that, that space is 54 inches at the front of your tunnel, it has to be 54 inches at the back of your tunnel. Because if you were to install your, your hip tracking like this and then your baseboard is like, like this, let's say, for whatever reason, um, you're never gonna be able to roll up your roll up sidebar because that's a straight bar that only rolls up and down. It's not gonna roll on a wave or roll on a curve per se. Um, so having a uniform height um, uh, is, is critical here. Um, and again, we just use string line. Um, usually we just pull four or five inches up from the top of our ground post um, at one corner and then the other corner down the length and then run our string line. Um, and then we pull seven and a half inches up from the ground on one corner, make a mark, uh, and then uh, find the distance between that seven and a half inch mark and that mark that's up on the hoop. Um, and usually that gives us somewhere around 54 inches. Um, and then we just copy that down there at the end of the tunnel. Um, if your land is doing all types of stuff, you're gonna have gaps underneath your baseboard and you can just fill that in with dirt or additional lumber, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so this video uh, sort of highlights um, everything I just said, just um, with the video. Okay baseboard math and a mistake. So before I showed uh, how we run our math to figure out the height of our hip tracking along here, um, well, I made a mistake um, in that, uh, well, it was a mistake. The method I described earlier was how we normally do it. Um, but in this case, because of the slope of the land, um, when we ran our string for our baseboard, um, it was just all sorts of uh, out of whack. And so what we decided to do was, um, was the following. So we measure up seven and a half inches, which is a two by eight nominal. Um, and we make a crow's foot mark and then we run our string line. Um, and typically what we do is from that seven and a half inch mark, we find the distance to the underside of our hip tracking and we copy it down there. Well, in that case, that made our baseboards height 16 inches down there just because of the slope of the ground. Um, and that just was too much. We would have to use too much wood um, and it'd be additional costs. And so what we decided to do was slant our hip tracking, which really just mimics the ground um, that much more. And so this pink string here denotes uh, where the bottom of our hip tracking is gonna have to get to once we move it. And this neon green string here indicates the top of our baseboard. Because remember what I said that it's critical that the space between the bottom of your hip track 
and the top of your baseboard is entirely uniform the entire way so that your roll-up bar will roll up evenly um, and will look good. Don't mind that this will that we are going to slant this because um, again it's mimicking the grade of the land and also um, it doesn't affect any amount of structural value. Um, yeah, it'll be annoying for us to undo and then redo some work, but it will move quickly because we move quickly. Um, and so since we discovered that on this side, on that side, we also made that same adjustment um, there. And so, uh, yeah, that's basically it um, for uh, the baseboards. Yeah, and uh, it, the, the proper word is actually uh, sloped the hip tracking. I was stuck on slant. Um, <laughs> so it's actually sloping. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, so once you get your purlins up, your hip tracking up, um, you can move on to the snow load trusses. Um, and in ideal world, uh, they will be level. Um, if you've leveled across your tunnel, um, the, the snow load braces, <coughs> excuse me, the snow load braces will <coughs> also um, be leveled once fully installed. And so basically, um, how do we, how do you find where to, the height to put them at? Um, basically, you get your snow load truss up and you get it temporarily fastened to the hoop. And then you pull a measuring tape from the top of the ground post to the underside of that truss. And you figure out what's the measurement on one side versus the other side. Let's say on one side it's 100 inches. Well, that would make sense. On one side it's 50 inches. On the other side, let's say it's 64 inches. Well, that's a 14 inch difference. You split that in half. One side has to come down seven. The other side has to go up seven to where you have an equidistant number between the underside of your snow load braces and the top of your ground post. Um, and that will ensure that your snow load braces are level. Um, if they're not perfectly level, it's not the end of the world. You just don't want them installed like this. Um, you really want them to be as close to level as possible um, so that when the snow hits, um, the brace, the truss assembly can behave um, as it's designed or engineered uh, to do so. Um, and I think these are all, again, I thought that uh, I was taking a video, but it only took one second. Uh, but again, assembly technique here, we laid out all the snow load trusses. I assembled those on the first day. We laid them all out um, and then we raised them all at one time. Uh, we typically have two people on the ladder um, and then, you know, those two people are on the ladder, two people are on the ground, raising them with them. Um, and then the people on the ladder continue back installing the struts. Um, the struts, I don't know if I had a picture of that. Let me go back. Okay, the struts, um, they are usually right around six inches below the second run of purlin. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to get very close to a 45 degree angle um, on your snow load braces, on your struts. Um, and, uh, you can stick a speed square up there to see, to check the angle. Otherwise, um, what we typically do in all honesty is we just sight it in. We do, we get it right on one snow load brace. We stick a level on there. It reads level. And then we just snap a string line all the way down and we're just moving it all up to a string, um, at that point. Um, so really rely on string, um, and careful measurements and then just, you know, replicate it, um, you know, in mass. We have a quick question about um, how far south in the country would you recommend snow load trusses, uh, specifically low country in the Carolinas? Um, yeah, I, I, I used to work for an organization down there. Um, yeah, you really don't see it down there. Um, you see more Kwanzaa style. They will have um, what they call stringers, which basically is just a bar in that top third of the, t of the hoop. Um, and that just helps the tunnel from racking side to side. Um, it's not very common. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you have a tunnel manufacturer that has this as their package and you're in the South, yeah, I would go with it. Um, really just to protect against hurricane winds when they come. 
Um, Cause this will help with that. You know, if it's a, you know, a category four or five and it sits right above the tunnel, yeah, the thing's going to get squashed into a soda can. But um, generally these snow load trusses are, are going to help uh, against wind pressure as well. It's quite the image. I should have pulled up some of the photos of that tunnel, tunnel destruction in some of the wind storms around here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, thankfully for us, we've never had any issue with our tunnels. Um, when the big wind storms come through. Um, the only time we had a tunnel actually was one we built in Georgia and a hurricane came through and it was a Kwanzaa style tunnel. It didn't have any sort of stringer. Um, and that, I mean, that thing, oh man, it got put into like a, a bad soda can. It looked like it was ready to just go back on the truck it came from. Um, oh no. Yeah, so, um, and that's the, only, that's the only time we've had um, damage to one of the tunnels we put up from when so here construction skills yeah um so yeah is is there any more questions um that that was it for now but folks okay. do feel free to keep chiming in in the chat box um and we'll do a q a at the end as well okay um yeah and i will say you know i'm i'm we're talking about a high tunnel right now um I have built, we have built plenty of other types of structures from homes to barns to outbuildings, to pavilions, decks, tree houses, fences, all types of stuff. So, you know, if your question isn't or common isn't specific to a high tone, that's totally fine. And honestly, I would love to talk about some other stuff too. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, um, here we are. Um, and so, yeah, we're getting close to completion here. Once you have your snow loads up, your, tr your purlins, all the metal done, um, you can move on to end wall framing. Um, typically, um, in most cases, we're doing three foot on center um, framing. If you're in a high wind area, I would not go any more past two foot on center. Um, and I would do um, two sets of mid span blocking, not just one set as you see here. Um, and uh, we always recommend a minimum door ro means rough opening of three foot seven three by seven foot um that three foot's a nice number if you're carrying a tote you can comfortably move through your door with a tote you can get a wheelbarrow in there at three feet um you can get a small bcs tractor if you want to get a tractor in there like a tractor tractor um utility tractor of sorts uh your rough opening of your door has to be um, an eight by eight um, to comfortably get the tractor in there. You can get away with six, um, but it's going to be tight. Um, eight by eight gives you enough luxury um, to be comfortable. Um, and then our door, our doorway, um, we typically use four by fours um, to bolster that and we drop them into the ground um, two feet. Um, and to uh, uh, figure out the math on the end wall, um, it's pretty simple. Um, I don't know if I've got an image of it. No, sorry, there's a lot going on. Sorry, these are videos, not photos, ha ha. Um, basically what you do is you pull a measuring tape um, from the outside of your sidewall baseboard to the outside of the other sidewall baseboard. And in a 30 foot tunnel, you want that number to read very close to 30 foot three inches. If you see 30 foot five, 30 foot six, you'll be okay. If you start to see 30 foot eight, 30 foot 10, yeah, you've got, you've got a situation on your hands of that tunnel just being too wide. Uh, most manufacturers will give you um, a two to four inch uh, margin of error, which is significant in terms of the construction industry, um, you know, to have some wiggle room with the tunnel just not being perfect. Um, but let's say the tunnel is perfect and you pull your tape and it measures 30 foot three um, and then you take half of that, which is 15 foot, one and a half inch. And that's the center of your tunnel. Um, and if you want your door on center, then from that center mark, you will step back in this case for a three foot door, a foot and a half, and you'll step ahead a foot and a half. Um, and so that will give you a measurement if you were to step back. So a foot and a half less of 15 foot, one and a half inches is someone do the math for me while everyone's on mute. <laughs> um, that basically gets you to 13 and a half feet. Um, 
thirteen seven and some change. Um, and so uh, that number, you need that number to cut your baseboards here. Um, and so once you have that number where your door is going to be, if it's on center, that's the length of your baseboard for your end wall, and you cut those to length. Um, and so you can get a 16 foot piece, cut that down to 13, or you can get a 12 foot piece and then splice on an additional foot and a half um, to get the full length that you need. Um, and then from there, you dig your holes, drop the post in there um, and install your brackets. Um, and yeah, like I've been saying, I do apologize. We had a video on how to frame. And again, I did not realize it was only recording for a second until we started making this presentation. Um, but I will do my best uh, to use two pencils to describe how to frame an end wall. It's really just about scribing. So let's say that this is your hoop, one side of your hoop, and here's your stud. When you raise your stud, it's going to stick taller than the hoop. Well, you want to get it plumb, and where it crosses the hoop right here, you're going to make a scribe line. You're going to take a pencil or a pen, and on the underside of the hoop, you're going to dash a line across this stud. You drop that to the ground, and now you have a mark on that. But it's going to be a mark that's going to look like this. It's going to follow the slope of the, of the hoop. Um, what you do there is on the low side of that mark, you are going to go down three inches, make a mark, and that's where you're going to cut. You're not going to cut at that scribe line. The reason for that is because there are brackets you have to install, and those brackets have a three inch um, standoff that they need between the top of your stud and the underside of the hoop. Um, so that's why you have to, you know, add an additional three inches to that mark. Um, so it's not three inches going up, it's three inches going down that you'll cut on the stud. Um, and that's basically it. Um, it's super simple, you know, it's just a matter of plumbing it, scribing it, and then, you know, subtracting the three inches and, and making a cut. Two um, quick questions about that. Um, do you make a flat cut or an angled cut? You make a flat cut. Um, it's going to be a square cut. Um, you can make an angled cut, but the only circumstance you'd make an angled cut uh, is if you're cutting that scribe line exactly and you are doing a DIY tunnel, let's say. Like back in the day, what they used to do before they came out with all these traps and stuff for these, um, you know, lower end companies, if you will, um, that weren't servicing the high like glass greenhouse industry. Um, yeah, people would uh, scribe it make that angled cut and then they drive a bolt through the hoop through the post and then bolt them all together um or they'd run nail strapping over that and sort of just like hug it tight to that um, but in this circumstance you don't you just um make your scribe mark uh come down three inches from that mark make your square cut and then install your bracket um, and you want your brackets to always be on the center facing side of your studs um, so you want that bracket to always be facing the center of the tunnel, um, on your, when you install it on your studs. And does the pictured end wall have king studs? Yes. So king studs are any stud that is uninterrupted from its base or mud plate to its crown or top plate. In this case, um, your top plate is your hoop and your mud plate is the mud <laughs> or your baseboard. Um, and a king stud most notably will hug or support the rough opening of windows and doors. Um, and so in this case, there's two king studs, they're four by fours and they are what are hugging your door. So they are also your door studs. Cool. So it would be the, the one, yeah, the ones on either side of the door there. Yeah, either side of the door, yeah. That's it for the questions right now. Okay, sweet. Um, and then, yeah, you run your mid-span blocking. Um, we typically do a cascading effect. Um, farmers like it because it gives them shelves to put things on on the inside. Um, and we'll cascade it because it's just easier to nail or to screw it off that way um, versus it all being on the same, you know, on the same level. Um, we, might, we might do that same level if in the case we... Um, um, 
uh, <laughs> hey Kate, uh, we, we might do, you know, if we do two sets of mid span blocking, uh, uh, you might not see it staggered. You'll see it all in one plane. Um, that makes sense. Um, and one more quick question. Um, I think you need to go back on the slide. It's um, if you put a, like a big fan or a vent in the end wall, do you need to use king studs or would you use king studs for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely totally, you do. Um, so for example, this tunnel, the studs are three foot on center. Um, and so, uh, if they wanted a fan, um, say a 30 inch fan, we would keep our layout the same. Um, and then we just frame in a little window, a box, if you will, um, in between one of the bays, the three foot bays, um, and sit that, that fan in there. Um, and if you go um, on our Instagram page and search through some of our older photos, you'll see a bunch of that kind of framing um, for in walls, uh, vents and shutters and heaters and things like that. And do you have advice for um, if a door starts to sag? So it looks like it says that's a problem for a lot of folks. Yeah, the, uh, the number one reason a door sags is because it doesn't have proper bracing in it. Um, and uh, I really wish I took a closer up picture of the last couple of doors that we did. Um, but basically, um, when we build doors, um, you're building a rectangle, right? Effectively. Um, and the rectangle is always going to want to, like everything on earth, move 10 towards gravity where the hinge, where the hinges are not connected. So the hinges are only on one side. The opposite side that it's not hinged, that side is going to want to drop towards gravity, usually. To prevent that, you have to install a brace at all four corners. Um, or as you can see in this picture, we ended up putting two diagonals um, to prevent the door from sagging. So effectively, um, uh, a brace is uh, any material that joins two perpendicular surfaces. So in your example, where your door is sagging, you would want a brace from your vertical part, your upright vertical part of the door to the top or horizontal member in the door. Technically those are called styles and rails, but we don't need to get into all that. Um, you know, once you have, you know, that corner and then you have a brace coming in between, um, that's going to help that thing prevent uh, sagging. You don't want it a small brace. You probably want that brace to be a minimum of 12 inches from the corner in both directions. Um, you know, or you can do um, a cross brace like this that is fastened to our bottom part of our door. So our bottom rail here. Um, and then it hits the style or this upright part here. Um, and it's fastened into that. So those are two perpendicular pieces that this brace is affixing together. So that prevents any, any movement. If we had joined this piece to this upright piece over here, I hope y'all, can y'all see my mouse? Okay. Yeah. So if you join the brace from this upright piece to this upright piece here, that door is still going to sag because those are two parallel pieces that can still have some, some vertical movement. Um, so the biggest way to prevent sagging uh, is to run bracing there. Um, and then, you know, if you want to add some insurance, you could get some metal L brackets and screw those on on the back. Um, and that can help too um, to prevent sagging. Cool. Um, another door question. Do you have a preference for a roll up door or a side hinge door? Uh, it's all about use. Um, roll up doors are nice, they're super quick to install, very challenging to get it sealed tight um, if you want to create some nice enclosure um, during the colder months of the year. Um, but it's great for working tractors. Um, and there, there are ways to get your rolled up doors tight. Um, um, but, you know, um, it takes a little bit of doing. Um, I like the hinge door um, because they, for us, they last long. And, um, you know, any chance to work with wood, you know, we're going to do that. <laughs> so. What about a rolling barn door? Do you find that has the same insulation challenges? Uh, rolling barn doors are awesome. You can buy, um, uh, what are they called? Sliding door brushes. 
They make them in all different sizes. Install those on either ends, actually in all three sides. Well, there's four sides to the barn door, but don't install it on the door on the floor <laughs> side. Um, but on the two vertical and the top side, you install that brush. Um, and that's going to give you a, a nice seal. That'll give you a nice seal for sure. And um, we have a question about what is a rolling barn door. Could you describe that really quickly? Um, yeah, so this type of door here is called a barn door, um, categorically speaking, and it's hinged or hung, which means that it's going to open like so. That same door, if we were to mount it on the face of the tunnel or on the interior of the tunnel, it will slide on rollers usually called a cannonball track system. And that's a sliding barn door. You see those most commonly in big agricultural structures um, and some barns. Um, actually, a photo that we have at the end um, has sliding barn doors on it um, because it was for a barn. Um, sometimes we will install sliding doors for a greenhouse, um, but those are usually for institutions, um, nonprofits, or um, farms that have um, uh the resources to pay for them because those pre-manufactured doors usually go for a thousand dollars a pop um so they're they're pricey um, but they're well worth it and one more question while we're on this piece of the presentation um what are your thoughts on laying landscape fabric um around the perimeter of the tunnel and then pounding a post into it uh yes and no uh landscape fabric after you install the posts doing landscape fabric before you saw the posts will it will probably get to the top three of the most frustrating experiences of your life um i do not recommend it at all um people still do it um i will still recommend not to do it <laughs> it's far easier to drive your posts and then run your landscape fabric abutting your posts um all the way down um, your tunnel and then when you install your baseboards just install the baseboards directly on top of that landscape fabric and that'll solve your problem or you can do the landscape fabric after you install the baseboards um, we used to always install landscape fabric um, but then my back went out <laughs> a couple years ago uh, in a freak accident um, and so now uh, we don't because i can't spend that much time on the ground anymore um, uh, but yeah it's a great it's a great thing to do because um the biggest thing in the summertime is, you know, when the weeds start to creep into your tunnel, you know, like the foxtail grass gets in there or pigweed or whatever gets in there. And then, you know, farm life happens and like you don't do anything until the seeds drop and then you're just in a mess of stuff. And so um, it's nice to have a little, you know, preventative barrier um, so you don't have to worry about weed whacking stuff into the tunnel. Thank you. Um, I think I caught all the questions okay. uh, that were popping up. So go ahead. And, and if I missed any folks, just uh, chime in again here. Okay. Yeah. And I think we only have a few slides left. Um, um, the plastic shuffle, um, the most exciting and the most annoying part of the tunnel experience. Um, it's exciting because you know you're close to the end and it's annoying because it's plastic. Um, and it's just very fragile and very expensive. Um, the plastic industry is a very wealthy industry, by the way, um, thanks to small farms all over the planet. Um, and uh, yeah, so when you do your plastic, um, if you do plastic film or you do polycarbonate, you have to start on your gable ends, your end walls. Um, you wanna do that first. Um, and uh, well, let me take a step back. Once you install your studs, then you can install the tracking over your gable end. You cannot install tracking before you finish the studs. Um, otherwise you won't be able to install your studs. Um, so when you go to install plastic on the gable ends, um, if anyone has any experience in sewing clothes, it's a very similar technique um, in one regard, in the sense that we wanna pull the plastic up over the ridge of the tunnel. Um, and then we have two people on either side pulling out all the wrinkles and creating a slight degree of tautness um, in that plastic film um, so that it's nice and flat when we go to staple this thing in. 
Um, and so you want to either start stapling from the center or if your door is on center, you want to start stapling from either side of the door. So on either door post working your way out. Um, and you want to push and pull those wrinkles out. Um, and you need to let that plastic um, <laughs> exfoliate uh, or expand. I just always like to put exfoliate in there. Um, expand uh, prior to using it because uh, plastic, when it's inside that roll, it's contracted um, after it's been formed in the factory. It's very quickly rolled up and then it's there. Um, and so you want to roll that thing out so that it expands um, and off gases a bit um, because that plastic will actually continue to expand um, once it gets on the tunnel. And so if you put it on too prematurely um, and you make it really, really tight, you'll be um, disappointed when you come back a few hours later and that plastic is quite loose um, because it's expanded after you adhered it to the tunnel. Um, and so some techniques. So um, in this picture on the left, uh, we're working um, to the right of center. Um, and so you're pushing, you want, if you're working in this example, right of center, you're making your sections taut to the left of you, if that makes sense. So if you're looking at the end wall, you have your king post that's to your right, you have a king post to the left. If you start on the king post on the right, you just staple that thing up. Don't worry about anything. Just staple it up um, and then you start pulling the tension out um, to your right um, or towards the outside of the tunnel um, and so you do that by pulling um, and you do that also by pushing um, and so essentially as you're stapling as you can see here with ferris he's stapling with his left hand and then he's pushing the plastic with his right hand so that the plastic on the left side of that stud becomes taut because the stapling is locking in that side. It's not locking in the leading side, it's always locking in the trailing side. Um, so you'll always be pulling the plastic taut um, on the leading side. Um, and that's basically, you know, the wind bam uh, for, for, for pulling the plastic on the gable end. Um, we, we install uh, uh, what they called wind flaps here, so opposed to fastening the plastic to the end right here, what happens if you do that is that um, wind will very easily sneak in right here between your roll-up sides. Um, and if you're going for any season extension, um, this will be your downfall, I can promise that. Um, and so what we do is we install a uh, channel lock or wiggle while tranking on this, on this post, your second post from the end in the corner. Um, and we pull this plastic tight around there and fasten it there. That, what that does is that gives us more wind protection from sneaking in on the inside of your tunnel. And then once your roll-up sides are installed, um, that also gives you some degree of some, some thermal enclosure. Um, again, it's plastic, um, but it does help. It does make a marketable difference. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically it for this end wall. Um, I will say that um, it takes a, it's a little bit of a science to get it right. Um, and that's the frustrating part because you're like applying science to plastic. <laughs> um, uh, but you really want to take your time trying to work these wrinkles out um, because those wrinkles, they will work out in terms of becoming loose plastic. And when wind gets to it, which it will, um, that's where you'll begin to have issues. Um, so you do want to take your time trying to get those wrinkles out as much as possible and getting this nice and taut. Um, definitely, you can pull plastic in the dead of winter. It's not fun. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're going to pull it in the winter, in the spring, and it's still like 40 degrees outside, just try to do it in the middle of the day when the sun can hit the plastic. Because um, plastic does freeze. It doesn't become brittle, um, but it will freeze. Um, which makes it really hard to use. Um, and then it will expand on the tunnel and then you'll have the issues that I, that I mentioned before. Okay. Okay, the skin of the tunnel. Um, yeah, I wish I had a different word um, than skin of the tunnel. Maybe say the tunnel's coat. Maybe that's what I'll say from now on, the tunnel's coat. Um, yeah, so again, there's just like little tips to this. Um, uh, I don't know if I've got an image of it. Yeah, here we go. Um, 
so you see this ladder here. So again, we pull the plastic out, we pull it all the way out and let that thing sit for a little bit longer, 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, and then we set, in this case, a 12 foot ladder. I always have the unlucky job. Um, I climb the ladder and I'll hold the plastic up with me. And then um, basically uh, I'm pushing that plastic up over my head um, the entire time as two people are walking that plastic down the side of the tunnel. There are other methods, um, but after installing over 120 tunnel, uh, this is the method that we use. Um, it works. You are only inside of the death trap for a few minutes. Um, and it really prevents um, two main things. It prevents the plastic from snagging right here, which it will always want to do. Um, and it helps it prevent, uh, helps to prevent it from slicing on these corners, which it usually wants to do. And so it's having a person up underneath, just sort of pushing the plastic over as people are pulling across it, across the length or down the length um, is, is super helpful. Um, and so then once you have the plastic pulled, um, you really want to have as many people as possible because I've seen plastic lift up a six foot, um, you know, maybe 160, 170 pound um, person um, off the ground when the wind comes. Because essentially you're just creating a big um, sail. And so what feels like slight wind to us is just exponentially exacerbated uh, when it comes to pulling plastic. And for whatever reason, it will be a beautiful day, but the second that plastic comes out, the rain, the snow, and the wind will come. So just be prepared for that. <laughs> um, I don't know if nature's, what nature's trying to tell us, but it seems to always happen. Um, so you pull the plastic out. Um, you wanna make sure you have about a foot of plastic on the ground on either side of the tunnel. Down, then down one side of the tunnel, you wanna put these placeholders in. Um, uh, so that it secures the plastic so you can work on one side of the tunnel. And you don't have to worry about the wind getting under and underneath it and just, you know, tearing it apart. Um, and then you're off to the wiggle train. Um, and so as you can see here by this picture, there's a very specific technique to do this. You roll up the plastic like you're rolling um, a Tootsie Roll um, or like a taquito. Is that how you roll a taquito? Um, or a burrito. How about that? Um, and then you are palm side down, applying downward force pressure to make it as taut as possible. Um, you don't want your knuckles in the plastic because they will blast through that plastic um, with the amount of pressure that you have to put down. Um, so you want to roll it up and then just, you know, push down as you can see here. Um, and so you have, you know, it's not that three people are doing this. You have two people that are applying pressure and then the person who's trailing is the person wiggling in that wiggle wire or the zigzag wire. Um, and you just shuffle your way along until you get the thing nice and taut down one side and then you do it down the other. And you always start in the middle, same purpose. You wanna push all those wrinkles out. Um, so the closer you get to the ends of your tunnel, periodically as you're tightening along your hip tracking, you'll have to pull out the plastic over the gable end just to get it nice and taut. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Um, you know, you can see some examples here of what it looks like when it's nice and taut, um, once the roll up sides are installed and the, um, the wire or the rope is installed. Um, that rope is just simply there to keep the roll ups, roll up sides from uh, racking or, you know, getting bounced by the wind. Um, and it looks cool. Um, and uh, yeah, here are some finished pics of this tunnel once all said and done. You can see here in this picture that your mid-span blocking um, is also another place to staple um, the plastic to. You want to put your staples, by the way, um, roughly every three to six inches. If you're in a high wind area, yeah, you want to do three inches and a real three inches. If you're in an area, you're not so much wind, uh, you can get away with six, but I wouldn't go any more than, any more than six. Um, most manufacturers send this uh, white batten tape. Um, it works okay. I will tell you after a good year of UV exposure, it's pretty brittle. Um, the best is old drip tape, old drip tape and old bike tires. 
Um, that's the best stuff around to use. It's pure plastic to your end wall. And also looks kind of cool. Um, it's got black. You put the blue stripes facing out. You kind of got like a little retro thing going on. Um, and it can look kind of cool. Um, but yeah, this is what the finished picture looks like. Um, you know, everything's nice and symmetrical. Um, you can see here that we just eyeball the center ridge. And depending upon whose eyes are calling out what's straight, it might be a little windy, but um, it's all good. Um, it doesn't affect the structure um, and so on and so forth. All the other purlins, they're razor straight because we snap string lines. Um, for the center, because there's no bracing holding it, it's, it's challenging to snap a string line. Um, and so we just eyeball center. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wasn't on the ladder this day, so it's not my eyes that were wavy. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, and installing the roll up sides, you know, that's a very simple procedure. Um, the instructions that come with that are, are super simple. Um, one thing I didn't show is that uh, on these baseboards, there are eye hooks, or technically eye screws. Uh, and um, you need to install those um, almost exactly three inches from the top of your baseboard. Um, the reason you wanna do that is because your roll-up bar is roughly 1.75 inches. Um, so it's about an inch and three quarters or so. Um, and if these are all installed properly, you can rest that roll-up bar on them when you're attaching the plastic to the roll-up bar. The plastic is attached to the roll-up bar with little clips, clamps that just clip right on. Um, and that will give you a nice and straight roll-up bar. Um, and you can just use your eye hooks for that. Um, and so, yeah, those, um, those are installed every other bay, starting from the front. Um, and then you have uh, rope hooks or rope clips that are installed um, every other bay as well, um, alternating between the eye screws. And that gives you that zigzag um, fashion. Um, and yeah, that's essentially it. You know, um, you know, this farmer's happy. She's planting her flowers. Um, and, uh, you know, the big plus about our job is we get to see a lot of different farms. And so, you know, it's in, as everyone knows, it's invaluable seeing how other farmers do their thing because it can inform how you want to do your thing. Um, and so, you know, we can always share perspective, um, in regards to that. Um, and yeah, again, this is just information on how to connect. Um, for the person who asked before, this is a barn we built last year. Um, uh, and these are barn doors right here. I think this is like a 10 by eight foot opening. So these are decent, um, least sized uh, barn doors. They'll slide out and open. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, that was a fun project. Um, so, um, yeah, anywho, just check us out on our website. Uh, there's my email. If anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Um, and yeah, I'll just stop uh, yapping there. Thank you so much. This was, what, this is really great. This is wonderful. Um, so I know some folks might need to jump off right at one, but I do want to make sure that we also have time for some questions. So I'm just going to do my quick wrap up stuff right now. Um, I'm posting a link to our post event survey in the chat box here. And if you can just take a couple minutes to give us some feedback, it is super appreciated. Um, and uh, apologies again for the, the tech snafu. I really am grateful that everybody was able to hop back, right back on with us. So thanks for weathering that little bump in the road. Um, and we figured out the issue, so it should, should not happen again. Um, all right. So I think there's enough of us on here, um, a good enough number that we can go ahead and just unmute and kind of do a little bit of an open Q&A, more of a conversation. Uh, and Blaine, I want to respect your time as well. So, you know, if you need to, to call time on it, then please go ahead and feel free to do so. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm good for another half hour. Um, yeah, the Great. baby's at the grandma's today, so I'm living <laughs> life. She's great. She's a fun addition to Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question. So for Maryland, um, what would be the drop dead kind of time frame to get seeds started or transplant started in the um, 
high tunnel before like the real code sets in so where we can really get production um yeah it, 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 it will vary based upon um your climate range um what part of the state you're in um so what part of the state are you in okay sorry say that again howard county columbia okay okay oh yeah oh yeah so you're in central maryland um yeah maryland has a uh eight different climate zones um, so each, each one has a very uh, specific sort of response I would do. But um, yeah, so for Central Maryland, you could seed in the greenhouse today. You probably, um, now if you're seeding like greens or radishes or turnips, um, yeah, you're probably not going to start to see those in any harvestable form, maybe until uh, January um, at best. It just, you know, if we have a hot December, yeah, that will change. Um, or a warm November, it, it will change. Um, if you're trying to put like carrots and stuff, yeah, you're gonna talk about any carrots you're seeding now, they're for the spring. Um, okay. Uh, you know, so if you wanted like, you know, if you wanted to harvest carrots for a fall or winter crop, you are seeding those in August. Um, or you're seeding those at the beginning to middle part of September, um, you know, and same with greens. Now you could transplant lettuces um, into your tunnel uh, all winter long, and they'll 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 keep as long as you do um, you know row cover and keep your tunnel nice and tight and so on and so forth. Um, those will those will because they have a shorter um, turnaround. Those will do okay. Great, thank you so much. Yep. Blaine, what about uh, east-west versus north-south orientation of the tunnel? I assume everything is supposed to go east-west, so you get the sun coming in the side of your Gothic tunnel. Yeah, that's you know an ideal world. Um, but if you're putting it in a field and that field has no trees around you, um, and so I would consider that full solar exposure, um, it's not really going to matter a whole bunch. I would be a little bit more uh, cognizant of like which way do my rent, my winds come from can I split the difference, you know what I mean, um, for the tunnel. Um, but if you're in like a, an area surrounded by trees, yeah, you want to try to pull off, um, you know, east-west orientation as much as possible. Or if you're putting a tunnel amongst other crops, yeah, you got to think about, um, about the shade that that tunnel is going to create um, for crops that are on like the low side. Um, or if the sun's, you know, sun's coming up in the east, crops that are on the west side of that tunnel are going to get shaded for part of the day. Um, which can be an advantage depending upon what you're planting. Um, so, you know, that's that's the short of it. Hi, um, I was wondering about the bubble wrap that I've seen some people use. It's like mm -hmm. a really heavy duty bubble wrap. Have you used it and what do you think of it? Um, I haven't used it. Um, I think it's expensive still. Um, I, I, I don't know uh i've read about it I'm, I'm not sure i totally um believe in the creator's um idea why we why farmers need it um but um i think if more farmers begin to use it yeah yeah we'll probably start to see it more frequently but i know right now the costs are too high and um uh there aren't enough farmers using it for it to be like widespread you know widespread adopted um, but if you, if you wanted to use it, I would start on like a smaller structure, um, and then see how that performs for you. Um, and then, you know, if you really like it, you know, scale it from there. Um, I always just generally advise from an agroecological standpoint that, um, any new technology a farmer adopts, you want, a, um, adoption to take place on a small scale, then observe verifies efficacy in your system and then scale it from there um, that usually is a safe way of ensuring that um, any new <laughs> any new cultural or technological um, influences in your farm system um, are, are you know are managed properly okay the um yeah so the, the one installation i saw they had problems because the pieces are smaller Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking they would have to seal all of the joints between they, the plastic. They do. Um, they definitely do. Um, 
And yeah, that's another thing, you know, it's like, um, the name of the game is like farmer, farmer empowerment, farmer self-sufficiency. And so that's why I was saying like, just be wary about new technologies as they come in because they always come with a bunch of new things you got to do to keep up with it. Um, you know, in the first generation, you know, after a couple of years, they might, you know, get it figured out. Yeah. I have a question about fans and ventilation. Sure. Um, I, I came in a little bit late, so just tell me if you already went over this so I can just look in the recording, but, um, um, how do you calculate the size of fan or, or, uh, vent you need for your high tunnel? Um, yeah, so the equation is called, um, uh, it's called your CFM. Um, and that's a measurement of uh, air circulation, airflow. Um, and so uh, the basic equation is to find the cubic volume of your tunnel, which is your footprint times its height. Um, and that will give you the cubic volume of air mass that's inside the tunnel. Um, and then you'll just determine from there based upon uh, if you're heating it, if you're planting in the ground, um, what crops you want to grow, so on and so forth. Um, and usually manufacturers will do those equations for you. You can do them yourself just the same. Um, but for example, if you have a 30 by 72 foot tunnel and you want good airflow, um, what we found is roll up sides and four 30 inch vents will do that for you. Um, if you are heating your tunnel, no matter the size of that tunnel, you have to have vents in your end walls um, for that heater uh, for two main reasons. One, um, it's a propane heater. Propane heat exhausts propane into its condition space. So you have to have, have a way to exhaust that out. Um, and as it's a heater, heaters don't recycle air. Um, and so to prevent stale air or too dry of air taking place in an environment where there are plants, you have to introduce moist air from outside. And so that's why the exhaust fan um, is, or circulation fans are crucial for that. So for the, you, for the first example you gave, the 30 by 72 foot mm -hmm. high tunnel with roll up sides, mm -hmm. you need four 30 inch vents. Is that on, what, on each wall or is that total? Uh, total, so that's two on each wall. Um, and so, yeah, the next question would be is like, okay, how high do I put those vents up? Um, so your tunnel, uh, usually has three to four thermal zones. The first thermal zone, um, is the soil. Um, the second thermal zone is from the soil up maybe 12 inches. Um, then you go for the third thermal zone is about 12 to six foot or the height of a human. Um, and then the fourth zone is from the height of a human to the top of the tunnel. That fourth zone is always going to be the hottest part of the zone. All it's the hottest part of the tunnel. And it's usually the part of the tunnel that you want to have the least concern with conditioning, um, because heat rises and cold sinks. Um, and if you remember that, that will be helpful for thinking through it. And so we put our vents right at chest height because we want the hot air to vent out at our working height. So it's a little bit more comfortable for us as people, but as the heat rises from the ground up, um, there's a slight convection that begins to take place. Um, so if you have your roll up sides up, which your roll up sides are only ever gonna be really as high as your chest height is, that's just how most of these tunnels work out. If you have your roll up sides up, then you have your vents at that chest height, those roll up sides because the hot air is at the top. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, there's, there's higher pressure. And so it's drawing air in, it's creating convection current. And if you have those vents open, it will suck that out the end. And so if you're ever on a hot day, lay down at the bottom of your tunnel with your vents, your doors and your roll up sides open, um, you will feel a very slight current uh, moving around down there. Um, and that's not just because it's windy, um, it, it's because of the convection. So your vent, your vent size and number, does that not change based on what your doors are like? Because we have a high tunnel that has roll up sides and then we have these huge doors yeah. on both ends. And then yeah. we have one small vent at the very tippy top and I've never opened it. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's exactly right. So yeah, some farmers will be like, look, we don't want vents, we just want big doors. And that will give you the same thing too. Um, the we you want to consider vents particularly in the spring when let's say you you just want to stabilize the temperature fluctuations, but you don't want to open the doors to have a massive heat loss. Um, and that's where the vents are nice. Um, and sometimes when it's too windy, those roll up sides, the wind just blasts in there. Um, and that can be abrasive to plants at times. Do you think that having vents at the top near the, the peak on either side and walls are pointless? Um, no, they're not pointless, but they're not giving you the biggest, as big of a gain as you might, as you might think. Um, yeah. A question for Blaine. Uh, the uh, flower farmer whose uh, high tunnel you showed looks mm -hmm. like a single piece of plastic all the way over the top. Yes, sir. If you want to have the double wall, that only goes on the top from the uh, hip rail around to the other hip rail. And, and No, <laughs> the two layers of plastic you can install in your roll-up sides and on your gable ends. It's a, it's a, uh, the install is a little bit more tedious, um, but it's definitely done um, and it's super common in Pennsylvania. Um, they have these jumper cables, which basically are just like corrugated tubes, um, stretcher tubes that, you know, you have your, your blower that's blowing the air to inflate your bubble on the roof of the tunnel. And then you have these jumper tubes that go down into your roll up sides and it will literally inflate the roll up side. And then you can have jumper tubes that go to your end walls that will inflate your end walls. But you have a, you had a single track uh, on the hip wall. Would you need double track in order to do the two layers? Yeah, yeah. So in Nolt's case, they only now for their hip tracking do double tracking. They only do double track um, pieces. They only will give you single track for um, your your gable ends if you're not doing polycarbonate. Um, so you could always do two layers, you know, added as an addendum um, if you wanted to. But it looks like like your gable ends were uh, just on the wood anyhow, stapled everywhere, even the like the baseboard just stapled in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this one was this one was single layer. So let's say you wanted to do two layers on this one retroactively. You would pull another layer of plastic over the top, install a, a blower um, that could inflate your top. You would then have to pull more plastic and clamp that onto your roll-up sides um, if you wanted to inflate your roll-up sides. And there's a, there's a basically like a, uh, a seam sealer, a plastic sealer, like a vacuum sealer that will stitch those two layers of plastic together for the roll-up side to act as a pillow, essentially. Otherwise, that hot air is just going to escape. Um, and then for the end walls, um, very similar, you would install channel lock along your baseboard and you'd pull another layer of plastic over it, wiggle it in the top, and then wiggle it in the bottom and on the sides. Um, and then that will give you sort of like a balloon on that gable. I'm thinking of polycarbonate for the end wall. So I would just be interested yeah, in including that. Yeah, that's much, that's much simpler. Um, yeah, polycarbonate on the, on the end walls is much simpler. And you'll get, you'll get a better R value with polycarbonate. Thanks so much, Blaine. We got to run. But uh, this is yeah, a no terrific, problem. terrific presentation. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Running. Um, I have a question if nobody else does. Go for it. Um, so would you rather build like, you know, um, again, like a lean to against like a, a barn or would a freestanding structure be a little bit easier? Um, and, and like what context? Um, just like something small scale, maybe 24 feet in length. Um, yeah, it just, it just depends. Um, you could get a, a 21 by 24 foot, you know, greenhouse or, I mean, high tunnel package. Okay. Um, you know, they make those and they make them as wide as a 16 feet, I think, or 18 feet. Um, okay. after that, it's just a caterpillar tunnel. The lean to, um, the lean to is really advantageous if you want to do any kind of natural building um, in the context of greenhouse construction, or if you want to add an addition to a home that has like a food production zone in it, or if you have um, like a central barn 
you know, wash pack house area that you want to adjoin a structure to because you already have electricity and some condition space and utilities there. That's where a lean to style greenhouse really comes in handy for that. Um, as a standalone structure out in the open, um, if you're not trying to do like a natural style greenhouse, um, you know, a Gothic is, you know, and a kit will just be a more effective way to get it done. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, because we have a barn, so I could add on to that, or I could just do a freestanding structure. I'm just trying yeah. to figure out the benefits of both because I'm, I'm a newbie to this. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Um, yeah, Stephanie, that's what I've heard too. Stephanie wrote in the chat box that um, she's heard that you can add about 14 days of growth to your season for a high tunnel or like good row cover and maybe 28 for both together. And I, what I've heard and experienced is, is similar except for um, when you start getting into really, really low light situations. Mm -hmm lights a limiting factor when the temperature is as plain as that your experience too yeah 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 definitely so like if you're in more of a northern latitude um you obviously are going to have to get uh your stuff in the ground for winter and fall harvest much sooner than say we might or people further south um and um yeah yeah i mean that's that's about right um i I don't know if I, in my experience, if it's, if it's like seven days and 14 days or 20 days is a hard, fast rule. Um, you know, I think of it more like zones, the more covers is the more zones South you get. So if you're in zone like six, a plastic will get you to seven, a row cover with plastic might get you to seven, a B row two rows two rows of row cover and plastic can get you to 7b so on and so forth um you know so like no are you going to prevent the tunnel from freezing when it's you know freezing temperature outside no you're not but you'll definitely help to prevent the ground from freezing and for winter and fall production in an unheated tunnel that's really what it's about is just trying to stop that ground from heating in the nighttime because once the sun hits it you're gonna have that temperature um, spike up. That's the question about the best time of year to install a high tunnel. Um, it depends on where you live. Uh, it sucks working with metal when it's very hot outside. If it's 90 degrees outside, that metal is too hot to touch. Um, but if it's freezing outside, it's too cold to touch. <laughs> so you really gotta, just gotta, you know, for us, you know, if, when we do do tunnels, we tend to only do them between um, April and October is usually our window. Um, but we've installed them in December, February, January. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of how miserable you want to be. Um, but for the plastic sake, um, yeah, you really want to wait. If you're going to do it in the dead of winter, you really want to try to just wait till you have a day that's above freezing to pull that plastic um, in an ideal scenario. Um, if it's below freezing, you know, just really just wait till it's like super sunny. If you absolutely have to pull that plastic, just let it be sunny to get it on there. Um, and then if you can't wait and you have to install it, just know that you potentially will have to come back, um, you know, in the warmer months and take out the wiggle wire on sections of the tunnel and pull that thing taut. Um, and we've definitely done that before. Makes sense. Have another a thank you in the chat box. That this farmer is going to be hiring someone to oh. the tunnel now. Oh, make it a barn. <laughs> also, if you are looking for resources about doing winter stuff, I know SAR has uh, some pretty good like online resources if you are a beginning farmer too, along with working with Future Harvest and some of their beginning farmer stuff as well. Thanks, Evan. Um, uh, yeah, Blaine, um, do you, do you want to, I, I know we had a question if someone could, uh, from someone about, um, I don't remember who now, about some of the other projects that you'd, uh, you've been working on. Um, if you want to take a minute just to 
you have a couple of the projects that you really enjoyed? I don't know. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, put any pictures up or anything, but. Um, yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I mean, right now we're preparing for a timber frame raising for a farm inside DC, Three Point Harmony Farm. Um, they want a, a wash pack house um, area. So we did a timber frame pavilion for them and DOL, Dreaming Out Loud, the farm at Kelly Miller's having a massive pavilion that we're working on and DC Greens has one coming down the pike. And um, uh, yeah, there's, an, you know, right now, you know, a lot of farms are, will get in touch with us uh, who are looking for like full farm development, you know, so like they want to focus on getting their infrastructure up. So like one farm, we're putting up two barns and a woodshed and we already did a high tunnel for them. And, you know, another farm wants like a natural greenhouse and then a barn and a few other things from there. And, you know, so farms will usually hit us up for like, you know, full on packages because we'll do the design work um, in house um, and so on and so forth. So we try to like bundle all that together, but, um, and then, yeah, I mean, right now we're like, we're, you know, we do do small things here and there. Um, you know, we've got like a really nice chicken coop that we're building right now for a farm. And then, um, like she also wanted like a pedestrian bridge. So we're doing a bridge for her. And yeah. So it kind of varies, um, particularly with COVID it's buried a bunch this year. Um, but usually we tend to just have like bigger projects that keep us going. Um, usually around the woodworking and timber framing, you know, context. Um, we do do greenhouses and hoop houses still, um, but we have tended to do those for institutions. Um, and, um, you know, for like a very limited number of just farmers throughout the year. Thank you. That's good to know. It's super helpful to have this resource of just experience building hoop houses in the mid Atlantic region because there are so many, there's a lot of guides out there, but there's so many specific concerns like you were mentioning, like wind and the cost of materials and other things as well. Hmm. Uh, I right. have a really random question. Sure. Um, so I got this great copy of Mother Earth News like two years ago and like the cover was like make your own makeshift greenhouse with old like windows and stuff. Uh -huh. Have you done that? Like what do you think of that? Um, yeah, yeah, I've done a bunch of uh, creative stuff like that. Yeah, it's great. Um, for a production farm, yeah, you're, you probably will never see that. Um, but for like a homestead, um, or it's like loop super small scale, or maybe for like an educational um, center that does some level of food production. Yeah, yeah, you'll see that kind of stuff happen. And I think it's great to be in all honesty, it's a great way to, you know, reuse, you know, salvage materials um, and be creative. Um, you know, it just takes more time and um, it, you, you're just not going to see that at scale. And, you know, most of the farms, you know, they're producing at scale. Um, so that's why you wouldn't really see that kind of stuff, but it's great. I mean, you know, we've done it in Puerto Rico, a friend of mine did it in Akikik. Um, you know, it's just, you have to have the time to be creative and to look for the materials. Makes sense. All right. I'm going to put the link to that post event survey in the chat box one last time. Um, thanks folks to anyone who's already filled it out and to everyone who's going to click on it and fill it out. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. And so thank you, Blaine, so much. It's thank been you. you. And uh, yeah, we're very grateful for your expertise. Yeah, thanks for having me. And it was